All right, well, it is 11 o'clock, so let's um, let's jump into it. I just want to introduce myself. I'm uh, Mike Bernier. I'm a certified financial planner with Cantor Wealth here in San Diego, and I'm joined today um, by our guest, uh, Paul Lim. Uh, he's joining us as a volunteer with the uh, San Diego Financial Literacy Group, um, or sorry, Literacy Center here in San Diego. Uh, worked with Paul for probably the last 10 years or so. He's an awesome resource on you know, kind of everything insurance. Um, you know, today we're going to dig into, you know, life insurance. We'll start, you know, pretty basic just on, you know, why do you need life insurance? What types of life insurance, um, you know, is out there? What might be the you know, appropriate option for people? Um, we'll dig into long-term care insurance, um, both from, you know, why you, you might consider having it, you know, to the, you know, the cost of long-term care these days. Um, and then from a tax perspective, uh, you know, if you have, like a corporation, you know, what might be the best way to take advantage of long-term care policies, you know, tax-wise. Uh, we'll get into HSAs, health savings accounts um, as well. And then, you know, at the end, we'll open it up for, for questions, you know, kind of a broad topic, life insurance, long-term care insurance. Um, so if anyone does have any questions as we go through this, um, there should be a chat button um, down at the bottom. Uh, so if you click on chat, type in your question, you know, I'll take a look at that as we go through. Um, and, you know, either hit that question, you know, right then or, you know, at, at the end, I'll, I'll review them and make sure we get to as many as possible. Um, and then if we don't get to, you know, any particular questions, um, you know, we could always follow up with, with information. Um, also, just wanted to mention that we are, you know, trying to hold, you know, more webinars, especially, you know, in, in today's environment, you know, people want to get information. Um, so we do have some other upcoming webinars. We have one uh, coming up on June 23rd at 6 p.m. So it's going to be an hour, 6 to 7 on June 23rd. Um, we've had her on before, but uh, Michael Canzoni, another CFP with uh, Cancer Wealth, is going to be interviewing Colleen McLamory. Um, she's a Medicare expert. Um, so I'm uh, going to kind of dig into the basics of med Medicare and then, you know, as well as, you know, some strategies and, and thoughts, um, you know, and, and just in general, you know, how to make sure you have the appropriate Medicare policy. Um, so that'll be June 23rd, um, and then I'm going to be hosting another webinar on uh, Tuesday, June 30th at uh, 1 p.m. with Adam Swanham. Uh, he's an estate planning attorney that I've worked with for a really long time, um, you know, real good guy, but, you know, wanted to go through, you know, basics on estate planning as well as, um, you know, in today's environment, you know, with um, certain, you know, certain things that you want to be aware of, you know, especially as we've gone through covid um, recently, there's been some hiccups in people's, you know, powers of attorney, healthcare directives, um, you know, so just pointing out a few things there. Um, we can also always access that on cantorwealth.com backslash webcasts. So that's plural, uh, cantorwealth.com backslash uh, webcasts, um, where you can see all of those, you can register for those. But all right, well, I want to jump into it. Um, you know, Paul, I really appreciate you, you know, joining us. Um, you know, I know insurance can be you know, kind of a topic that maybe some people are familiar with, but, you know, we want to dig into some, um, you know, thoughts and ideas today revolving around life insurance and long-term care, but, um, you know, just wanted to welcome you, and maybe other than what I threw out there, maybe you can give just some quick background on yourself. Yeah, Mike, thanks so much for inviting me on your show here, and I do think it's important for us to not only talk about investments with our clients, which is really the primary uh, content of what we discuss, but also having backup plans just in case something happens. What is the plan? Making sure that it's not going to be financially detrimental to your goals, and so that's the, the purpose of today's discussion. All right. Well, well, well perfect. Well, um, let's start with with life insurance. I mean, let's just jump into it. You know, maybe um, you know, just discuss like kind of in, in your thoughts, like why do people need life insurance typically? Sure. Most of the time, the main reason why people need life insurance is income replacement. See, what you'll do is you'll figure out how much you're expecting each person to earn, at what point they're going to retire, how much of that income they're going to save, how much of it they're going to spend, and those are a lot of the main inputs in the financial. So if one of the people passes away unexpectedly, you lose all those paychecks that we were expecting them to earn from that point until their retirement. That's naturally gonna change all the math, as you can imagine. So what you can do is you can solve for a lump sum tax-free amount that would be sufficient to replace all the paychecks we would have expected that person to earn in a normal case scenario. So coming up with that figure, knowing that you're insured for that, 
eliminates the uncertainty associated with the question that says, hey, what happens if something happens to one of us and now we lose all that income? Am I still gonna be able to retire? Am I still gonna be able to send Junior to college? Knowing what that number is and being insured for the appropriate amount of time, which is mostly your working career, is really crucial to maintaining the integrity of that financial. Yeah, I think that brings up an important topic like that I didn't, you know, throw out there and mention, you know, I think a lot of this is just, you know, in general, just risk management, right? And, you know, we're going to be talking about different types of insurance, but at the same time, it's just, you know, like you said, with income replacement, it's looking at, you know, having like a good, you know, financial plan in place and, you know, have like a baseline. Okay, here's if everything works out great, you know, here's if I work, you know, the next X number of years, I retire, we live long lives. But, you know, what we're kind of getting into is just, you know, unfortunately things that, you know, a lot of times we don't want to talk about, but, you know, it's really important to run, you know, different what if scenarios to say, okay, well, like in my case, you know, I plan on working for a good amount of time. And so if you look at my financial plan, um, you know, if I work, you know, and I get to retirement, then, you know, everything looks great. But, you know, I do, I have run, you know, different what if scenarios to say, okay, well, if I was to die prematurely, you know, how does that affect my plan? And like you said, you know, if I, if my family doesn't have my paycheck, um, you know, for the next couple of decades, then um, obviously that changes the plan quite a bit. So yeah, it's then backing in and figuring out, okay, well, how much then of a lump sum do I need or does my family need in order to keep that plan consistent with kind of that base plan that we have? You got it, you got it. So, um, so, so I know there's di different types. I mean, I guess the, the, the highest level would be just term versus permanent insurance. Sure. So most of the time, most people's needs can be addressed with a term insurance policy. What you'll do is you specify how long you want to be insured for, which is mostly your working career. So I would say mid-60s, early 70s, something like that. If you have a term policy that's going to cover you through those ages and for the amount that's appropriate in order to replace your income, which you can assist them in calculating, that should really take care of most of your needs. But sometimes there are cases where if somebody has a large estate or if they're going to receive a large pension, maybe you need some kind of a permanent insurance policy, one that's going to last through life expectancy, which is usually age 95 or so. So this is a little bit more of an expensive policy because the risk to the insurance company is much greater. It's a short and very calculable risk for the insurance company to figure out what's the probability of someone passing away at these particular ages. But if they know that they're going to have a payout guaranteed at some point through that person's age 95, naturally they're going to need to charge more for that in order to have the money with which to come up with that promise. So my point is, Permanent insurance policies can be very expensive, and so it's important to make sure that you're going to select the right kind and the right amount so that your premium dollars aren't wasted, in essence. So I'll go through the main types of permanent insurance in a little bit, but that kind of gives you an overview of why it makes a difference to have a term policy versus a permanent contract. Yeah, and, you know, like just to continue to like use my, myself as an example, you know, big concern sometimes with term insurance is, okay, well, but then it's going to expire, like it's going to expire, you know, in 20 years or in 30 years or 15, whatever you end up getting. Um, you know, and like in my case, I'll tell you, like, I, I hope my life, you know, my term life insurance policy expires. You know, I hope I pay this premium, um, you know, all the way until retirement. And, you know, it's a complete waste of money because that would mean that I'm still here. Um, but, you know, it it's, going to be the cheap, you know, cheapest, right, would be the appropriate word. I mean, there's nothing. In, in almost every circumstance. And, and you do have to kind of reframe the insurance in a way that we do with car insurance or house insurance. You know, you don't buy car insurance hoping you get in an accident or hoping that your house burns down. You're buying peace of mind. You're buying a backup plan. And like you said, it would be a best case scenario for you not to have to put a claim in because it means you won the bet and you made yeah. it past that point in time and you lived a long career. Yeah. And, you know, like when I, I'm doing planning for clients or, you know, for myself, it's, you know, my goal is that, you know, it, we need it for income re replacement, you know, like you had said earlier. So if I, you know, make it till retirement, well, my wife and I, or, you know, my family, we're going to have a certain amount of assets, whether we're both around, whether one of us are around. So 
at the time my term policy is set to expire, you know, I won't have a need for life insurance. Um, now, like you mentioned, there, there could be, uh, you know, cases or there are cases where it makes more sense to have, you know, permanent or whole life, you know, type of insurance. But um, there's lots of different kinds of permanent policies. That's right. You know, the main differentiator between whole life, universal life, variable life, it's going to be how the cash value is determined. So to back up, when you pay a premium into the policy, part of that premium goes to cover the cost of insurance, but a small portion of it goes into a cash value account. And unfortunately, it, it's often very misleadingly labeled as a tax-free savings account. But you got to remember, you're funding that thing with dollars that are already tax-free. So it's not going to be as amazing as it is often represented. So when you have a policy that earns a cash value over time, sometimes those are just invested in some fixed instruments, like in a whole life policy or a universal life policy. I don't know that that's the best decision right now, especially given that interest rates are so low. That means the crediting rates that the insurance company can afford to pay you are also correspondingly low. You'll also have some policies where you buy mutual fund-like investments. That's a variable universal life policy. And so that value can fluctuate in accordance with the stock market. So in a way, you're almost tying some of your insurance and protection planning to the stock market, which can be dangerous in some cases. And then, I mean, it, it's always complicated I know whenever you look at any of those, you know, t types of policy, but like, you know, with variable um, or variable universal life, you know, being tied to the market. I mean, with everything that we've seen um, so far this year with, I mean, just a tremendous amount of volatility and, you know, back, you know, February, to, you know, to the end of March. Um, are you seeing, because you're, you're, you're closer to this than, than I am on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, with some of the assumptions and illustrations that the insurance company or, yeah, the assumptions that they've made on how this is going to pan out over someone's life, you know, when you go through markets like this, how does that, how does that affect those types of policies? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point you bring up, because what's really important to understand, Mike, is that these policies, when they're initially sold, they are based not upon guarantees. They're based upon a best guess assumption as to how the market's gonna perform for the next 20, 30 years. You, you don't buy a VUL over a short time period. You're buying it, hopefully, to cover the entirety of your life expectancy, which for most people is gonna be like 40, 50 years. So if you're off in your projections and they differ from the report that was sold to you in the initial stages of the application process, the numbers are gonna differ hugely from what reality actually brings you. And so when you look on these illustrations, you'll basically see some large columns of numbers. They're gonna show you how much you pay in premium each year, how old you are in that given year, how much you'll receive in a death benefit if you die in a particular year, and then, of course, the most important comp, how much of a cash value is should in. I, should, I pull that, should I pull that up? Would it be helpful to share that one example at this point? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example of what that might look like. You know, if you can pull up a visual aid, uh, often what you'll see is a report that will show you line by line exactly how much you can expect to pay in a given year at a particular age. And as you scroll down, you'll see that as this person continues to put more money into the policy, the cash value increases at a certain point. Now, what's important to point out is the fact that often the assumption that they use on the growth rate is different than what happens in reality. So what you'll often find with clients who didn't expect something like this to occur is they'll find that their actual cash value on their statement is a vastly different number than what was shown to them in a report like this. One of the things they can do is request what's called an in-force illustration from their carrier. They can call their insurance company, give them the policy number, and then say, hey, I want to request an in-force illustration. I just want to see what will happen with my cash value going forward. You're, you're basically getting an updated report. Basically, uh, if the market were to perform using maybe six or 7% as a reasonable rate of return assumed going forward, what's that gonna look like for me? Is that, is, that, is that like an average, I mean, on the front end, when someone's buying a policy, is there a, 
maybe it's hard to answer. Is there a typical rate of return that's usually assumed, or is it in that you know five, six, seven percent range? Yeah, I think a conservative number is more like six. If you want to get really aggressive with it, maybe use seven. And I know it sounds like a point or two doesn't make a huge bit of difference, but when you look at it from a proportional perspective, proportionally, six and seven is a world of difference over 30, 40, yeah. 50 years. Absolutely. So, so. so when you when you look at these cash value figures and you receive your in-force illustration, you're going to see a report kind of like this. It'll show you lots of columns and lots of numbers. And it's important to remember, they illustrate for you a worst case scenario, a best case scenario, a middle of the road scenario. So we'll help you decipher exactly within those reports. But what you don't want to see is in the lower right hand corner where you see the numbers go to zero. In essence, what that means is that even though this particular hypothetical client paid in $9,500 for 40 years in a row, that money wasn't sufficient to keep the policy alive. Gotcha. Seeing that number goes to zero means that the internal cash value was not enough to cover the overhead. The amount that you'd accumulated over time, what you thought was a tax-free savings account, was insufficient to cover the internal expenses of the policy. And when that happens, you'll see the cash value kind of plateau at some point, and then it starts to come down eventually it hits zero and then you'll find that it's the worst of all worlds because you paid in all this money and now you have no insurance and there's no cash value either. So if that's going to happen to you in the future, you'd rather know now than at the time that it occurs because there's still things you can do about it. You can do a number of different strategies and implement them and that's really based on the individual. But more importantly, I think it's always important for anybody that owns one of these variable type policies to get an updated report, see how accurate it was as far as reality is concerned, especially now during these times. Well, because, yeah, let me just to kind of, so if we go back, like when it's you know initially sold to you, let's say it's assuming a 6% rate of return on average, um, you know, and if I bought it you know, beginning of, uh, or at the end of 2018, early 2019, okay, well then maybe, you know, that obviously would have been a great year, you know, and I would have hit that that target, but especially I would imagine if it's something I've held for a while, and if I haven't hit those target returns or, you know, with what we experienced earlier in the year, now projecting forward, it might paint a different picture than what was initially sold to me. That's right. You got it. So, um, and I mean, part, part of the reason too, because I mean, people look at this, you know, there's the death benefit, but also a savings vehicle when you start looking at permanent insurance, um, you know, and so that's why like term insurance is typically cheaper, right? Because it's just, you know, just strictly the cost of the insurance where, you know, you're going to have a higher premium, you know, typically with a permanent policy and with something like that, where some of it's going towards the cost of the insurance, some of it's going towards that savings vehicle. But then, you know, my understanding, I mean, you're, you're the expert here, like, as you get older though, the cost of that insurance continues to go up, right? You know, so that's also what starts causing those policies to erode in terms of value, is that right? Yeah, you can naturally expect that the risk of someone passing away is going to increase as they get older. And it's not one of these slow increases, like it's like a hockey stick kind of a graph in your 60s and 70s. So what you'll find is that the cash value increases that you might experience from the market are insufficient to overcome the amount that's going to be deducted from internal costs because the risk of people in your age group dying increase with each subsequent year. So you're going to find that the it's an uphill battle that gets steeper and steeper with each subsequent year. It makes it harder and harder to actually earn money in a policy like that. And a lot of policies are designed such that you don't get both the death benefit and the cash value. You only get one or the other. So if you actually did use this as a life insurance policy and receive a million dollar payout, well, you just relinquished all that cash value that was in that quote unquote savings account to the insurance company. They got to pocket that, right? There are some policies which do pay you both, but you have to pay a lot more in premium to get that amount. And when you do the math on it, you'll find that the opportunity cost of that money doesn't justify the amount that you receive, even if you do get both. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so what do you, you mentioned, you know, it's, it depends on the individual, but let, let's say that 
like you said, you recommend if someone has a policy like that, that they reach out to the insurance company, get an updated in force illustration, mm -hmm. and you know, I get it back and I should and it shows that it goes to, to zero, um, you know, a lot sooner than I would have thought, or I start having some concerns. I mean, what are what are what are typical strategies or what can people do? Um you know, to kind of readjust that, or would you recommend that maybe look at a different alternative if they're seeing that? Like, what what would you do? Yeah, most of the time, what you'll find is that people who have policies that are at risk of lapsing, which is when it expires without value, will be able to take their cash value completely tax-free. You see, the way that those taxes are calculated is they'll measure your cost basis, which is basically how much you paid in premiums minus dividends. There's a little formula. But you can basically measure how much did I put into this policy? How much am I getting out of this policy? Well, if the amount that you're receiving is less than what you put in, there's no earnings of which to speak. So there's no taxes associated with those earnings. The amazing part of this thing is that if you surrender these policies at a gain, that's taxable as ordinary income. In fact, there's a report you can request called a taxable gain report, which basically says if I were to take this money today, how much of this is subject to taxation? We get those reports all the time for CPAs when a client is doing something like this. So the mere fact that taxable gain reports exist proves that the characterization of this policy as a tax-free savings account is pretty disingenuous. Gotcha. So the fact that you could potentially pay taxes on gains in a policy makes it such that it's not a tax-free savings vehicle. So my point is, Usually, if your policy is in danger of lapsing, it also means there's probably not a lot of earnings in that account. So you can likely take a lot of that money completely tax-free. Just walk away from it. If you've owned the policy for a long enough period of time and you don't have these back-end surrender charges to which you're subject, you can often just walk away with that money, invest it in some non-qualified account, maybe a trust account or some other ordinary non-retirement investment account and then at least you'll pay capital gains if you make any money not ordinary income most of the time capital gains is less for a lot of people than ordinary income so you can reposition that money put it into a place where you'll actually get real favorable tax treatment on any earnings you might get and then you can buy yourself a term insurance policy and likely greatly reduce your premium outlay. Now you've just increased cash flow for the household. And if you want to take that excess cash flow and put it into that newly established non-qualified account, I mean, you're basically reproducing the arrangement that you had in essence. And then unlike the previous example where the insurance company would effectively take your cash value with you if you pass away, you now give your heirs a step up on cost basis in that account and they get the term policy death benefit. Yeah. So it's really a much more efficient arrangement in almost every scenario. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I was just having a conversation with a client client the other day. You know, what one thing that, you know, to at least point out is like what we're we're talking about and what you had just mentioned, and I totally agree with it, that you know, like once you, you'd probably be better off, you know, in most cases, not, not all cases, of course, but, you know, have insurance serve the purpose of insurance, you know, there, yes, there's that savings vehicle with permanent insurance. And some people like that, but yeah, as you start digging through some of the numbers, it might not be the most ideal, but, you know, the key in what you had just said is making sure that, okay, if I get the term policy, that whatever that Delta is, or that additional amount that I was paying on something else, or that I would pay on a permanent policy, that I actually do go ahead and save it. Right. You know, I, I don't think it's always the most ideal to have the savings vehicle, you know, in type of permanent insurance. But for some people, it's for savings. That's the only way that they are going to save. And so, you know, there might be some pros and cons there. But, um, you know, if you can do it outside and, you know, continue to save that, then great. But I know, you know, some people, if it's not forced, it's a little more difficult to save. I mean, that, that, that savings account component of the policy, it's illusory. It's not really yours. That's like a placeholder so that the insurance company can extract their overhead from an account with your name on it so they don't have to come knocking on your door for premium when you're 80 years old. I mean, that's really what it's for. Yeah. It's a placeholder for them to extract the cost of insurance from you at a future date and time. That really is earmarked for purposes of covering their risk. It's not really your money. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's totally true. What about, because um, what I've been, I mean, and maybe we've already kind of touched on it, but, you know, along with like annuities, but what, what I hear a lot about, I mean, especially in markets like these two is like index universal life. Sure. You know, like having a floor where you can't really lose anything, but you can get upside of the market, um, you know, tied to your life insurance policy. Yeah, those have become increasingly popular, Mike. And the reason why is because they give you these guarantees when you enter into an insurance policy, effectively addressing the risk of the VWL, where they'll say, hey, even if the market goes down, you don't ride that decline because we're going to put you into a product that basically credits you positive rate of return if the market goes up, but you don't realize any of the downside if the market goes down. And that sounds great initially until you really look underneath the hood, so to speak, and really figure out how those things work. First of all, they don't, uh, they don't ever invest your premiums in the first place. The money's never invested. What they do is they basically use a portion of your cash value to buy call options on different market indices. And then if the markets rise high enough such that those calls have value on their anniversary date, they exercise the calls and then they give you the illusion of rate of return by doing it that way. You get very little rate of return compared to just outright owning those indices or something that is like those indices because first of all those things don't include dividends like you would if you owned all the stocks in the S&P 500 so you miss out a great deal on something like that but also the market has to rise high enough for any of those calls to be worth something you have to actually first exceed a certain value before the call has any true exercisable value so you miss out on all that return on the way up. And then what's really misleading is the way that they credit you the rates of return. So they'll give you these things called cap rates where they'll say, hey, even if the market does amazingly like it did in say 2019, for example, we're gonna give you a ceiling. So we'll never credit you more than say nine or 10% or something like that. So part of the, what helps those VULs is those disproportionately good years. Sure. When you realize great rate of return during amazing years, that gives you a little bit of a buffer to suffer through the bad years. This is even worse because they basically cap your return and they pocket your return during those years when the market does exceedingly well. So you miss out on a lot of that upside that exceeds your cap rate. That's a huge disadvantage. Yes, it's true, you don't realize any of the downside, but when you really average that stuff out, it, it's because your money's never invested in the first place. It's really not a great comparison. Yeah. Sometimes they give you these things called participation rates, where they'll say, we'll give you 80% of the upside. So if the market goes up 10, you only get eight because they're giving you this participation rate. So when you look through all the smoke and mirrors and the ways in which they can credit you the rate of return you find that in every circumstance it's to benefit the insurance company and minimize the return realized by the client so again it sounds great in concept but as soon as you start digging and as soon as you explain to a client exactly the deal to which they're subject it really changes the picture gotcha um yeah no i know it's just you know, especially in markets like these you know whether it's that or like index annuities i know you know i just it sounds too good to be true. You know, it is. I mean, I love the idea of here, you can get all this upside of the market, you know, no downside risk, but you know, it's, I wish we lived in a world where an insurance company can make a lot of money. The agent that sells it can make a lot of money. You get all these guarantees, um, you know, but yeah, it's, it's just unfortunate that sometimes the way it's sold and the way that it actually works is different. Um, but any, you know, I wanted to make sure that we also, you know, get into long-term care, but any other, anything else you wanted to touch on um, in terms of life insurance before we switch gears? No, I think that was, that was a great overview of a lot of the issues that we see clients run into. And, I, and I, I really would represent to you that doing a financial plan in the first place, figuring out an amount that's prudent to replace your income, and then figuring out what products make the most sense is the way to begin. It's not to begin with a product and then figure out whether that's sufficient later. Absolutely. No, I, I, I agree. So... 
so yeah, I mean, like we talked about, so life insurance, you know, that's typically, you know, to replace, you know, replace income, you know, if you run your financial plan, like you said, and, you know, you need life insurance to make that work out if there was a premature death, lots of different options there, but then, you know, another risk to at least address. I mean, I, I think that's the key too in financial planning, right, is, is it's not always solved by insurance, right? I mean, for some people, it might make sense to, you know, transfer that risk to an insurance company. Of course, there's costs associated with that, but it's, it's figuring out what you need, right? You know, so even like with long-term care, and, you know, I know we'll go through some of these numbers, but, um, you know, as, as a population, we're, you know, tend, we tend to live longer, which is great, right? But, you know, our bodies tend to deteriorate. So, um, you know, more and more people are needing long-term care. And so, you know, I think that's a real risk to at least, you know, run in your financial plan to say, okay, well, if I did need to go into skilled nursing, or if I did need to go into a nursing home for some period of time, let's say in my 80s, you know, what does that do to my financial plan? You know, if I deplete my assets, you know, pretty quick, well, then maybe it, it does make sense to look at insurance, but maybe start and just kind of walk through, I know this is just a general page here, but, um, you know, just kind of the overall cost of at least some of the studies that are out there of long-term care. Yeah, so it, it's a great point you bring up, Mike, because when you're trying to figure out how much someone's going to save in order to live a certain lifestyle in retirement, one of the things that's almost never budgeted for is costs of aging, costs of services associated with aging. When you start to look at how much some of these basic services cost, I think it's going to be surprising to a lot of people. And you start adding these numbers on top of your ordinary living expenses, it becomes probable that you could run out of money prematurely at a time when it's not possible to go back to work anymore. So there do exist insurance policies that give you access to some money that you can use to cover some of these costs that we'll go through in a second so that you don't have to tap your retirement money. So just taking a look at some of these different services that are out there. I mean, you're looking at these numbers, 3,500 a month, 3,600 a month, 7,000 a month for a full blown facility. You know, if you want to go someplace nice, especially where we are in Southern California, it's more like 10,000. Right. So these are national costs done by uh, Generous Financial back in 2015. So these numbers that I'm showing you are also five years old. It's important to remember. But just let's, let's take some of these figures and, and bring it to life. Imagine if I needed home care, $3,500 a month. You got to pay for that with after-tax dollars. So if you assume that someone's going to pay you know, 30% in taxes, that probably means you got to pull out five grand from a taxable IRA, pay 1,500 to the federal government in California, then you're going to have 3,500 in your pocket to cover that expense. So now you're talking about doing that 12 months in a row, that's $60,000. And if your average period of care is four years, that's easily a quarter million dollars from your IRA that you weren't expecting to have to spend on services like this. So it just goes to illustrate how important it is for you to at least know how much these things cost and figure out a plan about what you're gonna do to address those needs sooner than later, or at least now when you can actually do something about it. And it could be anything from saying, you know, I'm just gonna save a whole lot extra. I'm gonna have a separate savings account, a separate investment account that I'm gonna use and earmark just for expenses like this and have that be my my backup plan or i can try and get some leverage on my money by using an insurance policy something that'll give me access to a tax-free pool a truly tax-free pool of entirely separate money that i can spend down so that i don't have to spend down my other retirement assets that were supposed to be for other things Gotcha. And yeah, and, and same, same idea as what you said with, I mean, any insurance, I mean, you know, that you could pay into something and never use it, which, you know, I would say is good news, right? You don't necessarily want to have to use the policy, but it's been a while since I've run any of these numbers, but I mean, do you agree or would you say, you know, anytime in the past when I've run them, you know, if you look at saving just on your own, like in a non-retirement account versus, you know, actually utilizing the long-term care insurance benefits, um, from what I remember, it, it always errs toward, I mean, a, a long-term care insurance policy will pay out more in most cases than what you'd be able to save by saving the premium and applying some rate of return, right? Absolutely. You know, the exercise that we'll do is we come up with what's called a hurdle rate. We basically say, hey, if I wanted to open an investment account 
and create the same exact promise that's going to be given to me by an insurance company in my 80s, what rate of return tax-free would I need to experience each and every year for the next 20, 30 years in order for that amount of money to come out to me? Usually, that figure is double-digit tax-free rate of return. So it's like 15% internal rate of return or something like that. And remember, if you want to get 15% tax-free, it probably means you got to do 22 taxable in right. order to net that. Now, there's just no real practical way to deliver results like that decades in a row. So in the event that someone does need a claim and does experience that kind of a payout from the insurance company, the equivalent is like earning double digit tax free rates of return for decades in a row. So it's very valuable if you do have a claim, just as you said. Absolutely. But um, big one though is like cost, right? I mean, I, you know, I love, you know, long-term care insurance if I end up needing it, but um, you know better than me just because you're, you're more involved in it. But, but what a premium's gone up, I mean, premiums have, I know gone up significantly, but what would you say over the last five to seven years? And, and why is that the case? Well, what's happening right now, Mike, is that baby boomers are retiring very rapidly. There's 10,000 of them particularly retiring every single day. That's going to put a lot of strain on the system. It's also important to remember that when these insurance companies first started making these products, they were way off in their calculations. They assumed this many people would need it, and in reality, many, many more people than that needed it. So they undercollected on their premiums. They should have charged way more. They should have expected that people would need care a lot more than they did. And because they greatly underestimated, what they've had to do as of late is, is play catch up. And that'll come in a couple of different ways. Either they'll do price increases on existing customers, which is never a thing you want to see, or they'll just stop selling old products and they introduce new products, which is always inferior to the previous version. And so what you found in the insurance market, just even over the last seven to 10 years, is a great decrease in the amount of leverage that one can experience on their premiums if they buy a current insurance policy. Now, luckily, today's insurance policies still provide really good value. They're still double-digit rates of return that you would have to beat decades in a row in order to manifest the same promise. But as, as products get shut down and as new ones are introduced, I think you're gonna see those things slowly start to decline over time. So I think it's important to address this stuff sooner than later, especially if you're kind of in your mid fifties and, and older, to, to really think seriously about maybe considering a product like this and everything uh, like that in order to address the risk. Absolutely. And, and I was just going to ask you, like, because uh, I think it's kind of changed over the years, um, you know, since I've been in the business, is that kind of the sweet spot? Like, would you say 55 to 60? Or do you, is yeah. there a point where you think it's too early to look at long term care insurance? Yeah, I think I do think there's a point it's too early. Because remember, if you if you get something in your 40s, and you're not going to have a claim until you're 80, just remember, you're outlaying premium for 40 years before you see any of it come back. So there's a long time to wait before you see any return on your investment, so to speak, if we're going to put insurance in investment terms. Now, you do get locked in at a really nice price if you get it at that age. It's probably very affordable at that period of time, but you got to look at all the opportunity cost about what you could have earned on that money instead if you put it somewhere else. So, yeah, I do think 55 okay. is about the sweet spot. It's about the right balance between number of years that you're likely to pay premium versus getting good deals from the insurance company and everything like that. Once you hit 70, it's pretty much cost prohibitive, unless you've got some significant wealth and you're still looking to get leverage on it. It can happen because somebody in their 70s is only going to have to pay for maybe single digit numbers of years before they get a payout. So in that way, even though it's a big number, they're only going to have to pay that a few times ostensibly before any money would come out to them. So it's, it's I think 55 to 70 is the time during which you, you really got to think seriously about this risk. Okay. And then, um, like you said, so when you get the benefit from a long-term care policy, that's tax-free, right? Correct. So um, what about, you know, one thing I know you, you and I were talking about recently is, 
like let's say you know I want to take advantage of you know the tax deduction now like if I own a business um, maybe you can just explain that yeah so one of the greatest ways in which to purchase long-term care would be if you own a C corporation now these are going to differ from S corporations in that C corporation owners are really considered employees so these are all your fortune 500 companies they're all C corporations most people avoid using this kind of corporate structure because of the double taxation component you get taxed on the corporate level and you get taxed on the personal level so you just don't see a lot of small businesses using something like this unless they're like you know heavy equipment or some other reason why they would be something like that but if you are lucky enough to be a c corporation owner you can essentially create an arrangement with the help of a tax advisor of course to make it such that you can pay for a long-term care premium with pre-tax dollars it's the same deduction the corporation would realize for paying medical insurance for its employees Yes. Okay. So you basically get to utilize free tax dollars to pay the premium. And then when the payout occurs, it'll be in, in the form of tax free dollars. It's amazing. That is a great way to reduce the costs associated with something like that. So C corporation owners who can really look at a long term care traditional policy and, and, and use corporate money. To, to pay for that premium, which they're already trying to reduce their bottom line anyway, so they avoid the corporate taxation. This can be a great way to consume a lot of those profits and, and buy things that they need anyway. And then no issue, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you'd bring it up. I mean, no issue, like let's say I have a C corporation and you know, I, I deduct those, those premiums and then you know, I, I retire, I shut down the corporation, um, you know, maybe it's fully funded, let's use as an example, no, no issue then as the owner after the corporation closes down of then, you know, assuming that just as an individual policy or is it always just an individual policy? You know, there aren't a whole lot of policies that are front funded anymore on the traditional side. So the downside will be that unless you create an arrangement with the new corporation owner to continue paying that, unless you negotiate that as part of your retirement package, you might in retirement have to start outlaying after tax dollars. Okay, but you could take it with you just yeah. on my someone own. Who, yeah, someone who's really clever uh, would pass the torch to the new C Corp owner and then also build in an arrangement to say, hey, by the way, I want you to continue paying my, my, my corporation, you know, keep me on payroll or do what is legally necessary in order to make that arrangement continue. And of course, you need to consult your tax and legal advisors before implementing a strategy like sure. that and make sure. sure that it applies to you. But in concept, uh, the, the corp could continue to do that. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, um, I guess, you know, not everyone obviously has a C-Corp. Um, you know, what are some options, you know, um, if, I, if I don't have a C-Corp or to fund, um, you know, health, health expenses with tax-free dollars? So another way to still take advantage of the arrangement where you get a deduction when the money goes in and pay no taxes when the money comes out it is to utilize a health savings account. These have been around for a while, but they exploded in popularity with healthcare reform because they're usually tied to the lowest premium plan because the lowest premium plans tend to have the highest deductible. Well, you need a high deductible plan in order to be eligible for a health savings account. And, and the way you think about it is like this. You fund it kind of like an IRA every single year. There are limits on how much you can fund per year. And then you get a top of the line tax deduction for it. After that, if you use the money for qualified medical expenses, you pull the money out and you pay no income tax when the money comes out. It's another one of those similar arrangements where you get the best of both worlds. Deduction on the way in, nothing on the way out. There's actually a cheat sheet that you, uh, you can use to kind of give you an idea about what's considered a qualified medical expense and, and what is not. But in essence, people that have health insurance plans with an HSA can basically buy all of those things in the purple category with pre-tax dollars. I mean, you think about how expensive medical care is on its own why not also try paying for that stuff with pre-tax dollars? At least you can take the edge off from that perspective. 
utilize your health savings account, something like that. So people that come to you asking about the types of medical plans that make the most sense for them could strongly consider this if, first of all, they have to have access to it through an HSA eligible medical plan. And also, you have to be fairly healthy. You have to be one of these people that says, yeah, I almost never go to the doctor. It's only if I'm, if I'm really in need of something specific that I, that I end up going. If you're the type of person that has high medical utilization, like you've always got to take this particular diabetes medication or something else, HSA is probably not for you. It's probably not going to make sense because the deductible is going to eclipse any tax savings you experience. But when it comes to the, the people who are mostly healthy, high earners, HSA is a beautiful way for them to reduce their income and then also have the potential to cover medical expenses with pre-tax dollars. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think the, another key thing to point out, you know, a lot of times people confuse health savings accounts or HSAs with, you know, FSAs, flexible spending accounts, you know, where same idea, right? You know, but, um, you know, well, at least to where you're able to use pre-tax dollars to fund, you know, medical expenses, you know, but a big downfall with FSAs or flex spending accounts is that if you don't use it, then you lose it, right? So you could... That's a great yeah, thanks for pointing that out because people do confuse FSA and HSA all the time and HSA is use it or keep it. And just like you said, FSA, use it or lose it. So some people might have had past experience that with a corporation, this is a totally different, this is a totally different vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. No, but it's, um, yeah, like you said, can be a great way. And then, um, yeah, even after retirement, you know, I mean, that just continues to, you know, carry forward, um, you know, to, to utilize that. And do you have to have earned income to contribute to an HSA? Yeah, I mean, ostensibly, you'd only be looking for real tax deductions if you've got earned income anyway. So I, I, I would say yes. And even if you, even if you don't have a lot of income for a particular year for which you're looking for a lot of tax deductions, just keeping the HSA open during a period of time is a really smart thing to do because there's no statute of limitations on reimbursing yourself from the account. So Michael, I'll illustrate this really interesting rule for you. Any medical expenses that you incur after the HSA is established and after there's at least a penny inside, you can always reimburse those things for yourself in the future. So let me give an example. Let's just pretend you had a $10,000 medical bill. Well, it would be really difficult for you to pay for that entirely with HSA money because they cap you on the amount that you can put in per year. You can't even put in 10 grand per year, right? It might take you three years, three calendar years before you can actually contribute a full $10,000 into that account. So let's pretend you put a penny into your HSA on January 1st of 2020. You'd actually be able to save that $10,000 receipt if you had something happen to you on June 1st. And then you slowly pay money into the HSA as needed, as tax deductions are needed, and as funding limits allow. And then you reimburse yourself from that account every single year on a tax-free basis until you fully reimburse yourself for that expense that you had to pay out of pocket with other money. Right? Gotcha. So just keeping all medical receipts that are incurred after the HSA had at least a penny inside, you can always run those through with pre-tax dollars at some point in the future, no limit. So being able to remember that rule and, and to be savvy about timing your contributions for when you need deductions, as well as what reimbursement amount will allow is, is a really smart way to take advantage of your medical costs and view them as tax deduction. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a re re really good point. Um, well, I wanted to remind everyone um, because, um, you know, th that we can answer some questions. I want to, you know, let, left some, some time aside. Um, but if you go down to the chat, you know, or your toolbar on Zoom, uh, you should see the chat like little, um, you know, balloon bubble. Um, if anyone wants to type in some questions, um, also, so I, you know, I, we do, you know, have a couple of questions already, so I'll make sure we get to it. But what I'm going to also post in that Zoom chat is the evaluation form. Um, each of you that are on the call, you know, will also end up receiving it um, via email. Um, but it, it's really helpful for us. Um, you know, like I said, you know, at the beginning, you know, during these times, you know, a lot of virtual, um, you know, content, you know, is, is being put out. We're trying to do our best to have different topics. And like I mentioned, 
you know, earlier, you know, we have other upcoming uh, webcasts or webinars on, you know, state planning on June 30th at one o'clock. We've got, you know, Medicare, um, Colleen McLamory, a Medicare expert, coming on again on June 23rd from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, but we're always trying to improve, uh, you know, these. So lots of different topics, but, you know, as I post this evaluation form, I'm going to post it right now. It's just at canterwealth.com backslash evaluation. So you should be able to click on that or, you know, put it in your toolbar if you wanted to take care of it now, or like I said, we'll follow up with an email, but, you know, any feedback on, you know, if you like the webinar, you know, um, you know, and then other topics potentially that you would like to see, um, you know, we're, we're happy to go, go through that. So, um, you know, please, if everyone could complete that. And then also, you know, I think something that both Paul and I had said, you know, as we went through this is, Every time we have one of these webinars or webcasts or anytime, you know, as an advisor, I discuss, you know, one particular topic. Unfortunately, we're just talking about it, you know, kind of in a bubble, right? Or in a silo of, okay, well, here's life insurance, here's long-term care insurance, here's some, you know, different options. But, um, you know, like we had talked about earlier, you know, it's really important to know how that fits within your financial plan, right? You know, of, you know, do you need it? How much do you need? You know, doing all that planning before you actually get to the point to, go out and purchase a policy, um, whether it's life insurance, long-term care insurance. So, you know, one thing that we've always offered is a complimentary financial checkup. Um, you know, I know some of you on the call are clients. Um, obviously, you know, feel free if you have any specific questions or if you want to connect with Paul, um, you know, feel free to reach out to your advisor. Um, but, you know, for those of you um, that, that are on that aren't existing clients, you know, I'm happy to go through a, you know, free financial checkup um, for anyone that wants to take advantage of that where, you know, we can look at, okay, are you retired? Are you near retirement? Um, you know, are you accumulating towards retirement? Are you on track, you know, with your assets? How much can you spend in retirement? How much do you need to have saved, you know, tax-wise? You know, we touched on a few tax topics, but, you know, looking and seeing if there's any tax planning strategies that might make sense for you. Um, you know, looking at your investments, giving you feedback on that, uh, the pros and cons of what you're doing, the internal fees, um, you know, the risk you're taking, potential for return, looking at insurance, you know, maybe something you already have, like, you know, Paul had said, you know, helping, you know, request an enforced illustration to, you know, make sure you have the appropriate type of life insurance, or maybe you need life insurance or long-term care insurance. Um, and then also discussing estate planning, you know, wills and trusts, powers of attorney, things like that. So, um, you know, if anyone wants to take advantage of that, um, totally free process, you know, happy to just try to get as much information and as much resources out there as possible. So on that evaluation form, you know, there's a spot that you could check if you want someone to reach out to you to schedule that. Um, if not, not a problem. I absolutely hope that you got a lot out of this webinar. And like I said, we're going to take questions in a second. But, you know, if you do want to take me up on that free checkup, um, you know, happy to, you know, go through that with you. Um, and then where appropriate, um, you know, have Paul, Paul Lim involved. Uh, if, you know, there's any specific insurance questions or help in evaluating what you have or what your potential needs might be. So, um, you know, I, Paul, I really appreciate your time today. Maybe if you've got a few minutes, we can go through some questions. I know you, you answered one in the chat box um, that, that maybe it'd be worthwhile. I've got some that were sent to me privately, but sure. I'm just going to... Yeah. Um, this, this, uh, this is a good one we can talk about with HSAs if you got a second. Yeah, go for it. If you want to like, yeah. kind of frame the question and then what your answer was. Sure. If they were... Uh... Uh, a person had asked whether COBRA premiums were reimbursable. So basically, COBRA is going to be the type of health insurance that you would purchase after you've separated from an employer's group plan and you're trying to continue that coverage on your own and now you're, you're paying the entire cost of it, not just the employee portion for which you were responsible. And so the question was about whether you could pay for those premiums with pre-tax dollars from the HSA, and that answer is yes. Okay. Uh, the second portion of the question was basically asking, can I reimburse myself for COBRA premiums even five years after you started to work again? I guess you should upload all receipts to the HC even if you don't have the money in there right now. I, I believe the rule is that if you had the HSA open during the time that the medical expense was incurred and you had funded it with at least a penny, prior to that expense being incurred, then you can run that very old expense through it with pre-tax dollars, assuming you met all those conditions. So that, that is my understanding of it. Um, if you need consulting on your specific situation, I actually do have an HSA specialist. And if you'd like to grab my contact information from Mike and, and, and I can 
connect you with, with my HSA specialist to answer questions about your specific situation, I'm happy to do that for you on a complimentary basis. Okay, no, that's awesome. Uh, and then uh, another question was on long-term care, and it's uh, kind of lengthy, but lo long-term care insurance, it looks like someone had an experience where, um, you know, a parent, you know, had long-term care insurance. So, um, you know, I would assume this is maybe an older, older generation, but had, had long-term care insurance, but it didn't provide any home health care benefits, which was, um, you know, unfortunate, you know, in this case. Do most or do current policies or more and more policies have home health care options or how does that work? That's a really great question. There was a, a change in the law uh, a little while back, which made all long-term care policies comprehensive. So you, you can't sell a policy now that doesn't cover home care as a result of that law. And it was situations like that that inspired that legislation. Okay. Um, well, perfect. Well, I know we're, we're getting close. Um, there, there's one that, you know, I, I can actually follow up with. Um, but anything else on insurance before, before we wrap up? I know, you know, hopefully, you know, a lot of people got, you know, a lot out of that. But um, anything else from your side or anything people should be aware of, Paul? You know, you got to view insurance really as a tool, as a complement to all the other things you're already doing. I, I think that the tendency a lot of time is for agents to view insurance as the end all be all. And, you know, a lot of them really live that expression that goes, uh, the man with a hammer sees every problem as a nail, right? Sure. And so I, I think that it's important to just realize that it's one component, it's a very important component, but you should be prudent about the way in which you select policies and, and really get a, a good perspective on it prior to implementing any recommendation. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, yeah, like I said, you can't just, you know, look, look at things in a silo. You kind of have to see all, how all this, you know, comes together. That's why it's always, you know, hard to just answer specific questions. I mean, some of these, you know, were specific enough to where we could just get to them. But yeah, you kind of have to do the appropriate planning to figure out, um, you know, what, what's right for you. So, um, you know, well, again, if, you know, if there's that evaluation form, um, you know, whether you want to take us up on the free checkup or not, um, you know, if you could give us some feedback, that'd be awesome. And, um, you know, if you need Paul's contact information, feel free to reach out. You can put that in the evaluation form as well. And I can follow up with that. Or if you want that complimentary checkup, um, you know, someone will definitely reach out to you. But, um, yeah, I know we co covered a lot, uh, you know, on uh, this last hour. But, Paul, you know, definitely appreciate your time, um, you know, and, you know, I'll let you know if, if anyone needs anything. And, and we'll go from there. Sounds great. Thanks, Mike, for inviting me on. All right. Thanks, Paul. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, you know, hopefully you got a lot of good information out of that and um, look forward to seeing some of you on our next webinar. Thanks a lot. Take care.